Hi, uh, I'm Ed Gillespie, I'm co-founder of Futerra's Sustainability Communications uh, and I'm sending in my low carbon contribution uh, to this Climate 2020 uh, group event about speed. Uh, obviously I've gone for the low, lowest carbon option by not actually being there in person. Um, so what is it about our obsession with speed? I've been asked to sort of crank open the debate uh, and answer some, or ask some big questions about where we might be going. So ever since uh, Tom Cruise in Top Gun said, I feel the need, the need for speed, we've perhaps been re-emphasising this excitement and notion of what speed does to us psychologically. And it's interesting in the context of Futera's mission, which is to make sustainable development so desirable it becomes normal. And speed has obviously been something that has been desirable. We've always wanted to go faster. Uh, ever since the days of the original automobiles, you know, we, had to, we were so worried about the threat of speed and the danger of speed uh, that we had a man waving a red flag walking along in front of the cars. And equally, when we started to go onto trains, people were convinced that the speed of the train would cause people's necks to break uh, in transit. Um, and there might be some people whose necks who might quite fancy uh, breaking at high speed. This is our, my good friend, Mr. Clarkson, who's obviously been part of the sort of celebration uh, of the obsession or, if you like, the excitement and wonder of, of speed. Uh, but I'd like to kind of make a provocation and take us in a different direction um, and ask to think about actually what progress really means in the context of speed and travel and climate change. About five years ago, I went all the way around the world without flying. Uh, people uh, mocked me, as is me and my Mr. Tree, ain't getting on no plane fool um, type of pose. But I went all the way around the world. This is the route I took. Um, I'm going to look in east to west direction. Um, and it was an enormous trip, covered 45,000 miles, 31 countries, 381 days, and most interestingly, 1.8 tonnes of carbon. Now, because I'm quite a kind of low carbon person in the UK, my footprint's around about two and a half tonnes, uh, and the UK average is about four and a half tonnes. So the conclusion I came to is you could go travelling overland in a slow, low carbon way, you actually save carbon rather than staying at home in Britain. So there we go, escape austerity uh, and go around the world. Um, and really what I was trying to explore was this notion of the journey being the reward. Look, actually the pace of travel uh, was changing the way that we saw the world and not necessarily always in a good way. Because um, let's face it, the world is becoming complex. I know this evening you're probably talking about policy measures and instruments and levers about how we might change uh, the way we travel, or change the speed at which we travel on our roads uh, and the potential carbon and climate benefits that might stem from that. Uh, but really, actually, when we, whilst those policy levers are important, uh, we're still kind of in denial about the kind of the scale and the urgency um, of the challenge that we face. Uh, this orange is obviously in that sort of form of denial. And just as an example of that, you know, you take something like the unburnable carbon report, where we're actually looking in the fact that there is more carbon listed on the stock exchange in London, about five times more in terms of declared assets, than we can actually realistically burn if we have a hope of staying within a two degree uh, of climate change shift. So there's a real sort of rude awakening that has to go on. So are we going to achieve these levels of change in, in terms of decarbonising our economy um, without doing something a bit more radical than just changing speed limits? Um, and it's also difficult when we have lots of vested interests at play who are doing quite merrily and happily well out of the status quo. So where does that change come from? Well finally we might be starting to see uh, some waking up here uh, of, of the kind of particularly the more um, conservative aspects of, of society and the economy. Uh, this is from that well-known radical left-wing publication Bloomberg Business Week following Superstorm Stat Sandy and saying you know it's global warming stupid you know we actually have to act in a much more radical way now. Uh, and really for us at Futera this is about changing the notion of sustainability, about being from an age of problems, um, whichever one of those um, happy bunch you want to pick down there, to an age of solutions. Um, and progress in this sense is no longer a linear thing. We like to think uh, that we go along on this incremental, inevitable, inexorable uh, march of progress. We come down from the trees and we become more civilised and end up planting trees. And actually, Progress is a much more complicated phenomenon uh, than that. You know, it ebbs and troughs, it peaks and flows. It can go backwards if you take your eye off the ball. Um, and in actual fact, it can end up creating what we might call a, a progress trap. Uh, and a progress trap is where our pursuit of progress is actually creating circumstances and impacts which undermine our potential for future progress. And it's very easy to see this in the idea of climate change, uh, where we're starting to 
We enjoy the world around us, which has been created through um, the availability of cheap, abundant energy, uh, but the pursuit of that progress has created impacts in the form of carbon emissions and the resulting climate change, which then undermine our potential for future progress. And you can argue a similar kind of thing around speed. Is the solution always to go ever further, ever faster, ever more frequently, or should we be asking a question about what the purpose and benefit of that ever-increasing speed is? And many movements have been starting to ask that question from the sort of slow food to the slow travel movements. Uh, and asking us, is actually the kind of wham bam, thank you ma'am sort of school of travel better uh, than the long, slow, sensuous seduction uh, that those of us who do overland travel tend to enjoy? So the big thing here is that we were not blindly opposed to progress, but we are opposed to blind progress. Uh, and we must question um, the drivers and motivations of that type of progress. And equally, this is not about a hair shirt sacrifice type of a, approach. You don't want people to feel like uh, there's been a massive great nanny state control over the way that they move and get around. Um, but it's not really about saving um, the planet and killing ourselves. It's not even about saving the planet, it's about saving us. Um, and I'd like to sort of frame that. Uh, in this idea of where behaviour change comes from and what the drivers of behaviour change are because everyone says they're very concerned about the environment but actually what we tend to find is people's willingness to act is inversely proportional to the impact of those actions. So people are prepared to say I'm not taking my plastic bags, recycling has become normal, uh, but they're not prepared to give up flying. Driving behaviours are often similar in, in that context. Uh, worse, we tend to get single action bias where people say actually I don't want to change, uh, or I'm already doing my bit, I've already made my, my personal commitment to the environment. And you see this uh, particularly in the idea of travel in terms of short haul aviation, where there's been a dramatic expansion of short haul flights, bunny hopping all around Europe. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the fact that there are a whole bunch of Brits um, sat at home thinking I really want to visit Thailand, although I'm sure Thailand is a lovely place. Um, it's largely because of a kind of artificially created demand. Uh, by offering cheap bucket flights by wonderfully um, responsible gentlemen uh, like Mr. Michael O'Leary. Uh, and that seems to be a kind of a speed thing. It's like going, oh, we can get to these places so much quick, more quickly uh, and cheaply. Um, and the other controversial angle of this is like, what's happening um, in terms of high speed rail in the UK, where there's a massive debate about who will actually get the benefit of high speed rail. Does it create jobs? Will it lead to economic benefits? Is it that much more desperate to get to Birmingham 20 minutes faster that will have a huge uh, boost to those particular regions. Um, and you know, we, we, we are still trawling through these, uh, these types of uh, benefits. Um, that said, you know, with the long established um, advantage that Eurostar has given us, you know, we actually have already seen the fact that we have a much, much greener form of high speed travel uh, than we do with aviation. So, Maybe it's not so much about how we do it, it's, uh, it, it's, why, it's why we're doing it. Um, but the other point to make here is that you know, it's actually about the quality of experience, particularly from a passenger perspective. Um, if you actually looked at, at something like Eurostar, you know, when we were finally putting in the last high-speed section um, from Dover to London, the last 20 minutes, uh, when we were actually upgrading that, it cost us several billion pounds to get it up to the same speed as that which uh, the trains were travelling in France. Uh, and that additional cost shaved only 15 minutes off the overall journey. Uh, but it cost so much money, we might as well have given everyone on the train free Chateau Petrousse, served by semi-naked supermodels of both sexes, and no one would have wanted to get off the train, uh, and they would actually would have appreciated the fact that it was lasting 20 minutes longer than before. So, speed is not always better. Um, Equally, you know, we want to need to make this kind of op these options accessible. Um, that's one of the reasons I've been involved in this loco2.com uh, train ticketing business, which is trying to make it as easy to book uh, a European rail ticket as it is to book uh, a European flight. Because, actual fact, technology is not going to save us on this either. Um, we, we look to the fact that, you know, we look to electric vehicles and cleaner, greener cars, but actually in an urban context, that's just going to leave us sat in clean, quiet traffic jams. We need to look at alternative modes of transport. Speed is not always going to be the solution. And really, it's walking, cycling, uh, and public transport which will make our urban centres work. 
Plus the fact we're also seeing shifts in the way and we have a relationship with the car full stop. Um, what we're arguing here is that actually business models are moving. Certainly car ownership in London is in decline. Less than half of London house households own a car. A car is a burden, so why not have a shared ownership car club or even peer-to-peer -peer rental type model like a whip car where you're essentially renting your neighbour's car, uh, which dramatically reduces the amount of embodied resources in vehicles. Also, you know, the need to travel is shifting. Um, business travel is in decline. You know, we're looking at more and more sophisticated um, video conferencing type of work. So, you know, we're, we're seeing enormous shifts in, in that demand for that type of travel as well. And, and, you know, as a London cyclist, I can also vouch for the huge uptake uh, in London cycling. When I first started cycling in London about 15 years ago, it was a minority occupation now. It's like the Tour de France peloton um, as you roll through the streets. Um, which brings me to my sort of conclusion is like, is this notion of hypermobility, like the fact that we always see progress, particularly in the context of the climate change challenge, uh, as something where we're always going ever faster, ever further, ever more frequently? Uh, and is that actually the kind of trajectory where we should be on, or should we be looking more radically to an idea of keeping calm and localising more, actually looking at resilient local communities where, whilst there will always be trade and movement of goods, people and services, um, should we be asking a more fundamental question about how and why we get and move stuff around? Um, and I always mention at this point, you know, in the notion of this ever-increasing speed, you know, 200 years of ever-increasing speed from Stevenson's rocket all the way through to supersonic jet travel suddenly took a, a step backwards uh, in about five or six years ago with the early retirement of Concorde. And for the first time in, in two centuries, uh, human travel just got slower. Uh, I like to think this might be uh, an intervention point which might make to consider the way we get about more. So my conclusion is to you is I, the past and the present are not always great predictors of the future, particularly in the context of carbon mitigation and, and the climate change challenge. So what we perhaps need to be doing is moving beyond the very useful short-term policy interventions such as adjustments around speed limits, which may well be delivering uh, carbon benefits uh, in, in terms of managing our overall impact. But that's missing a much, much bigger opportunity whereby thinking a bit more deeply, uh, a bit more radically and a bit more innovatively, we might actually get other benefits such as localisation and resilient communities uh, and economies uh, and looking at different ways of travelling within and between cities which could answer some of the bigger questions that we're asking in other contexts of society. So uh, my challenge to you is to, to think big, think radical and think lateral uh, and not to get too bogged down in, in the nitty gritty of the day-to-day -day policy interventions. Thank you very much.